tales for dark nights. Each to their own. Written by Gareth Shore. Performed by Jesse Cornett. Featuring Ashley Tolfo and Jordan Lester. Ignoring the fear all around her, she clutched the crucifix with both hands, closed her eyes, and prayed. The chain dug into her neck as she bent her head upwards, seeing through eyelids and the overhead lockers and ceiling and the clouds all around and up and up through the sky and beyond. Her lips moved in prayer, not rushed, but shaping words that she had said all through her long life, since Sunday school where she had first learned them. They were warm and familiar and calming in the bubbling panic in the cabin. People cried out as the plane lurched again. The small Bible almost bumped out of her lap as she pressed against the restraining belts. Helen knew this wasn't just turbulence. The cabin staff clutched seat rests as they swayed down the aisle, their drawn faces betraying the truth behind the comforting words. Somewhere further back, a baby's shrieking was made worse by the squeaking of a toy, and Helen traced the cracked gold letters on the front of her Bible as her fingertips spelled out the words, New Testament. A present from John when they started courting, she imagined Joanna rolling her eyes at the word. They had read it together hundreds of times over the years. A little tatty it may be, but John's inscription on the inside cover, written just days before the Lord took him into heaven, made it a precious thing. As she stroked the cover, she mused on how the years had smoothed its surface, where age had roughened and veined and wrinkled hers. But Mom, why Joanna? Everyone calls me Joe, which sounds like a boy. Even Dad. My English teacher has nicknamed me Steiny. He even says it during the register, and all the rest have started now. I thought Joe was bad. What's wrong with... Aaliyah, or Ella, or something that at least sounds like this century. Joanna, red-faced, finally stopped for breath, slumped scowling over her elbows on the kitchen counter. She could only reach because she was on her baking stool. Helen, both hands deep in a mixing bowl, puffed dangling hair away from her face with the corner of her mouth to disguise her smile. Steiny? She glanced at her wedding ring and crucifix next to the radio, an old reflex she couldn't help. Steinway! Uh, as in the piano? Mr. Alderley says rhyming slang for piano is Joanna. He's just weird. And it doesn't even rhyme. <coughs> it does if you say it with the right accent. You're laughing, aren't you? It's not funny. It means a gift from the Lord, remember? Joanna hopped down from the stool, flapping her arms angrily. <sighs> not that again. Yes, yes, and I'm so special, and the most precious thing to ever happen to you and Dad. Shame you couldn't give me the most precious thing in the world to you. A decent name. <laughs> a flicker of a scowl flashed over Joanna's face before she burst into a smile. Her anger always burned bright, but briefly. 
just like she did every day, Helen looked at her daughter with wonder. Really looked and felt her breath hitch at how beautiful she was. Joanna's wide eyes fizzed with her father's energy, and her face was the mirror of Helen's when she was a girl. Before middle age had sharpened those rounded edges and started to hollow her cheeks, she is the best of me and John. Is it any wonder I can thank God every night and every morning for giving her to us? Right, you gift from God, fruit of my womb, and albatross around my neck. Helen's eyes flicked to her crucifix. Jump in the shower and I'll help you get your dress on. Dad's going to be back soon. He better be anyway. First communion is in two hours and counting. Joanna's smile immediately soured. And don't start all that again about it being weird, young missus. She squatted down and looked right into her daughter's bright eyes. Come on, you've not done all that preparation in school for nothing, and you know how important it is. She reached for the chain around Joanna's neck and pulled the cross out from where it had been tucked into her school blouse. Now go forth and cleanse thyself, Steiny. Blood and flesh of Christ. What's not weird about that? Weirder than Mr. Alderly. Helen heard her and chased her out with flowery claws. She came to smiling, then felt blood trickling down her face. People around her cried and jabbered to each other as the whole plane seemed to groan and shudder. Luggage had spilled from some of the lockers and a hard suitcase lay in the aisle next to her seat. Her hand shook as she felt a large lump where it had hit her. Then checked her crucifix and Bible as a dull ache thundered in her head. The two seats between Helen and the window were empty, so she could see straight through the glass to the swirling gray outside. No storm, just clouds must be some kind of mechanical fault. She thought she could smell smoke, but found it hard to concentrate as her ears crackled. She swallowed to pop them and tried to twist in her seat, but the belt restricted her. A vicious jolt sent a flicker through the lights, but they stayed on. There were still some raised voices, people crying on their phones, but she could hear sobbing, shaky murmuring, and quiet but clear, someone saying a prayer. I bet it's that woman with the shouty voice, all vest and tattoos, cursing like a sailor earlier, and listen to her now. Helen laid one hand on her Bible. I know the proper words, and I mean them, ingrained in me. I've lived by them. I'm prepared. Helen had always wondered at the foolishness of those who turned to prayer just to try and stop something from happening. Please, God, stop this cancer. Please, God, don't let me fail my exams. Please, God, don't let this plane crash. Their ignorance always made her angry, even as she tried to forgive. Bad things were part of God's plan. And if they happened, then it was because he had willed them to. She hated the cliché, God moves in mysterious ways. But Helen believed it. Believed it when God had taken John in his forties. And believed it now. Did I pray for John to live? No. I accepted God's will. John's waiting for me and will have forever if I stay strong enough and worthy. She thought about the long years without him, unwilling to add them all up. It's been a lifetime, but maybe I will join him in a few minutes. She tried hard to stifle the sudden heat of excitement in her stomach. Joanna will grieve, but she will eventually remember my lessons and be comforted. She still believes. I know she does. 
even if she has strayed. She remembered observing the other passengers in the departure gate queue from flight LVREV-214, hauling their transgressions and ignorance with them. Las Vegas didn't attract the kind of people Helen approved of, and once again, she had felt a bitter disappointment that Joanna had decided to get married there, remembered the arguments and pleading. What would your father have thought? Helen listened to the fear of her fellow travelers and found them wanting. No plane can fly with the burden of all that sin. She stroked her Bible and allowed herself a small smile. They all sat upright in Helen's sitting room. Joanna was obviously still angry with her, but Helen didn't understand why. She'd only asked Asif if he could recommend a mild curry, as the hot ones gave her heartburn. The atmosphere had gone chilly immediately, Joanna twisting and twisting her new engagement ring round her finger, and Asif mumbling that he didn't really like curry, but believed Korma might be okay. Asif looked neat. Helen would give him that much and he didn't have much of an accent as far as she could tell. Very quiet, too. He'd smiled politely when Helen had shown him the photos of Joanna she'd brought down from the loft. Christening, birthdays, school plays, confirmations, grinning up from a homemade perfume stall at a church fete. But Helen didn't think he was too impressed. She looked at him over the slightly wonky rim of her teacup, made by Joanna when she was a girl, and painted with chubby angels. Crisp blue tucked-in shirt, gray jeans, shoes, but no socks, she noted. Clean-shaven, that had been a relief, with what looked like oiled hair with a razor-sharp side parting. All in all, fairly acceptable, but still not what she had always envisioned, what she had hoped for. Joanna, still frowning, caught her and set her cup down with a clink. She took Asif's hand in hers, flicked a look at the big framed photo of her dad on the mantelpiece next to a picture of Jesus on the cross, and leaned forward on the edge of her settee. When Helen saw Joanna's frown fade and her mouth twitch like it did when she was nervous, she unthinkingly stroked the crucifix around her neck. Mom? Joanna squeezed Asif's hand, almost pulling him closer to her. We, me and Asif, have talked a lot about our wedding since the engagement. Three pairs of eyes glanced at the ring. Helen nodded and sat back adjusting her skirt with one hand, the other now clammy around the crucifix. Neither of us, um, want a, well, a religious wedding. And so we have decided to have a secular ceremony in Las Vegas. Asif studied the pattern in the rug very carefully as a prolonged quiet settled thickly over them all. Mom? I know it's not what you, or Dad, I suppose, would have wanted, but we haven't rushed into our decision. We're going to tell Asif's family next, and we both really hope everyone will be there. You will be there. Won't you, Mom? Helen seemed to have several tumbling thoughts at once. I wish John was here. I'm losing my little girl. She's turned her back on her faith. I must forgive her. What about everything I have taught her? Is this what God wants? She'll be called Mrs. Shaw. What came out was, 
I don't know. A stomach lurching drop and the cabin lights going out cued a percussion crash of terror around her. But Helen could only think, perhaps this is God's way of punishing me for letting my little girl down. Followed immediately by, but I've stayed true to his teachings. I have led a good life. I even got on this plane to Las Vegas against my better judgment, but everything happens for a reason because God wills it. A dark thought came, one tinged with both guilt and a certain thrill. What if this is God's way of punishing Joanna? Taking me into heaven whilst on my way to a wedding she knows I don't want to happen. Helen quickly pushed this away, angry at herself, and let go of her crucifix to hold her Bible in both hands. Fire! The engine's burning! Look! This side! I can see flames! All heads turned at the voice. Helen couldn't see that far back out of her window, but the dim cabin glowed orange and the screaming intensified. None of the flight crew hid their fear anymore, but tried to keep some order by shouting at a few passengers who had unbuckled their belts and flailed or were pitched into the tilting aisle. Oh my God, we're actually gonna die! Helen decided to read some of her favorite Bible passages, not out of desperation like some of the praying hypocrites around her, but because it was going to be her last chance. They'd been up in the air for several hours now, so she guessed they were somewhere over the open Atlantic. Not much chance of rescue, even if they survived the impact. She tried and failed not to feel a thrill of excitement as she thought that she would soon be in the house of the Lord with John. Yes, she would like her final moments on earth to be spent with the words of the good book, before she stood before the gates. No doubt clouded her mind about being judged worthy, for she had spent her whole life waiting and preparing for this moment, denying herself many of the pleasures that others seemed to think were theirs by right. The fools, not realizing their lives, were just a test to sieve out the unworthy chaff. Well, A lifetime of faith will soon be rewarded. She held her crucifix with her wedding ring hand and read John's message once again. The words shook as the plane broke through cloud and the moon glinted ocean and tilted horizon were revealed through her window. The little chapel in Rome was empty and a relief from the August heat outside cool in that hushed and shadowed and stone and marble way that Helen loved. Just her and John and a priest who blessed them in murmured Italian. She'd felt God's hands in hers as she held on to John's, the immediacy of it hitching her breath. John had thumbed her tears away as they knelt in the glow of the blessing. She knew God saw them, and recognized their devotion to him and their love for each other. Joanna was sulking back at the hotel, bored of churches and statues and the heat in that listless teenage stupor of hers. Watching Joanna's faith bleed away over the last few years had hurt Helen more than anything in her life, but she prayed for her daughter, asking God to forgive her lapse, and waited patiently for the day she would embrace her faith once more. Back in the glaring tourist roar of Rome's streets, Helen held on to John's hand and looked sideways at his profile as she shouldered through the crowds. Already, the cancer had etched lines into his face and grayed the skin under his eyes. The blessing still fresh upon them numbed the pain a little, but she knew the Lord was calling John to him and her husband would soon have to leave. 
Helen felt John slow in the heat and noise, leaning against her. Last night, she had prayed alone, asking God for the strength to support her husband as his was taken away. Feeling the Lord's hand helping her, Helen led John away from the crowds and back to the hotel. She decided that she would tell Joanna about her father's illness when they got back and invite her to pray with them. Helen hoped the Lord would help her daughter understand why they weren't going to fight the cancer, weren't going to resist the Lord's will. Ice! Ice! Everybody ice for the bat! Helen started to read aloud in the shaking chaos of the cabin. Her voice drowned out in the screaming, but the words familiar and definite on her lips. She had let her fingers find the page and the passage as the plane nosed down, pushing her forward against the seatbelt, passengers tangling down the aisle. Someone thumped into her headrest from behind, nearly jolting the Bible out of her hands, crying out in a language she didn't understand. Probably one of those crackpot religions, she thought. In the dim light of the engine burning outside somewhere, she traced the lines, seeing them in her mind as her fingertips glided over the faded words. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Helen repeated the words over and over, even as the noise around her grew. A keening, nails-on-chalkboard squeal added to the din as the plane pitched and juddered. She wanted to shout at them all, to tell them it wasn't too late to accept God into their hearts and repent of their sins. But all she could hear was the braying mass bawling for themselves. The plane tilted sideways, rolling over as it fell, and Helen sat ready amongst the tumbling madness. Closing her eyes, she thanked the Lord for showing her the true path that led back to her husband. She promised that she would keep a seat at the table for Joanna when... The crucifix bumping against her chest woke her. She felt arms around her and realized she was being carried. The light too bright to see who, but the arms were firm and gentle. She felt safe and protected. Squinting, she turned her head to look around her, shapes emerging from the glare. Giant marble columns speared up into a huge blue sky curving around them, each topped with a carved figure. She smiled as she recognized them, the calm faces of many popes gazing down upon her, and she murmured their names as they passed. The steady rise and fall of their progress lulled her as the sun warmed her empty, dangling hands. Her Bible was gone but she didn't mind. She knew she wouldn't need it now. Tilting her head back in the sunshine as she was carried across a square of gleaming stone, she saw shapes in the sky, high and flitting like swallows, but then she heard them singing and cried with happiness because she knew they were not birds. Yes. You were right all along. The voice wasn't hers, but she remembered it. Like a song from much younger years heard again after a lifetime. We are here. The arms lowered her to her feet, and she stood barefoot on the cool stone, head bowed, staring at the crucifix dangling from her neck. Gentle fingers lifted her chin, and she finally saw. Khalid's body 
still buckled into seat 35A, sank into the dark of the Atlantic Ocean with the wreckage of flight LV REV 214. But he woke with his feet tickled by the grasses of a far sweeping garden, crisscrossed with streams and rivers and waterfalls. People he had known and loved and lost sat under trimmed trees and waved to him. He realized his Koran was gone from his hand, and he grinned up at the hot sun. I knew it. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.